Wonderful. <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> good to see you. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Sorry, I haven't used this. Um, I haven't used this webinar technology before. If you look at it um, the, below, you can see also there. I can. I will put you at the moderator, and then uh, you can share your screen Perfect. later. I will. Maybe if you want, we can just try it quickly. Yeah, that would be great. Show my screen. You should see the a uh, small, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. I can see your screen. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. So just um, not too many. I just have a few slides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's good. That's good. And okay. how do I stop, or do you stop me? <laughs> so stop showing screen. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm also good. I'm always a little bit nervous on maybe I have those No, of course. Yeah, me too. Always the way. Uh, Ryan isn't with us yet. Not yet, not yet. So I, I hope he's coming soon because he is our moderator. <laughs> so it's out here. I'm sure he'll be along now in a minute. Yeah, yeah. I just sent him I sent him a WhatsApp a few minutes ago and and so maybe I just send him another one. <laughs> and then you do show up. <laughs> In Germany, we might have a another lockdown after Christmas. So the, the cases are really going up here. So everybody is quite a bit tense here in germany right now how is it in okay. ireland is it, i think it's a bit better i think right we have been in lockdown for six weeks um and the um we have just opened up again this week so it's okay for the moment but i do wonder um yeah i do wonder what will happen now with christmas you know um yeah yeah so Yeah, we'll see what will happen. My God, this is really a strange time. To, but I think humanity has already survived more threatful <laughs> uh, situations. At least we have some modern technology that is helping us. Yes, yeah. Those of us who have the, the access to um technology we're very lucky and are yeah even those of us maybe who wouldn't have used technology so much before um are now finding how it can <laughs> how it can serve us in these contexts yeah yeah imagine 20 years ago without all this communication technology you know how would yeah. we how would we operate <laughs> very difficult <laughs> mm. now what is happening to mr ryan <laughs> Two minutes, two minutes. I wonder, I hope he doesn't have the, the time wrong. No, no, he said joining. So 10 minutes ago, he said joining in five minutes. <laughs> oh, okay. He's obviously been um, delayed by someone or something. So, but that means he's definitely coming in. Anyway, that's the main thing. <laughs> Ryan is here. Okay. Oh, great. Hi, guys. Apologies. Hi, Ryan. Okay, hey, great to see you. Thank you. All right, Peter, you just let me know when. Okay. Do you 
you see my screen actually? Yes. So you should see you should see just the slide. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so maybe we open it up now. We start with the, uh, and then uh, Ryan, you can give, um, talk a little bit. And uh, in the moment, there are about 10 people. Maybe we okay. can welcome them and then uh, maybe wait a few more minutes or something like that. You just let me know when, Peter. I think we are, we are online already. Okay, perfect. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you joining us from around the world. My name is Ryan Thomas, and I'm honored to host this webinar today on faith and transformation, the United Nations Sustainability, Sustainable Development Goals, and the social teachings of the church. Today, we are proud to welcome Siona Sharkey, Director of Advocacy in European Programs from the Global Catholic Climate Movement, and Peter Nitschke, Faith Program Director of the Plastic Bank. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with the UN Sustainable uh, Development Goals, there are 17, and they range from ending hunger and poverty to providing quality education, as well as very relevant topics that we'll cover today, uh, climate action and life below the water. So uh, I'd like to introduce to, uh, two of our panelists today, uh, Siona and uh, the, from the, she is the Director of Advocacy in European Programs with the uh, Global Catholic Climate Movement. And before jo joining GCCM, she worked with, uh, I'm going to, I'm, I'm probably going to mess these names up here, uh, Trok, Trokire, the Irish Caritas a Agency, where she led climate justice advocacy for almost 10 years, including the Irish fossil fuel divestment campaign. She has previously worked for CIDSE, the Family of Catholic Development Organizations, based in Brussels and with the Irish Foreign Ministry. Her academic background is in EU studies, human rights, and development management. So we welcome her. And then also we have uh, Dr. Peter Nitschke, who leads the faith program of the Plastic uh, Bank, engaging people of faith to reduce their plastic footprint as part of their spiritual journey. Before that, he lived for 20 years in the Philippines, he was involved already with Plastic Bank in the Philippines and pioneered the now thriving local branch, enabling local communities to develop their potential to work themselves out of poverty and building local leadership is his passion. He was involved in the leadership of several NGOs and academic institutions before returning to Germany in 2018. Peter gained his experience in urban transformation by relocating for eight years, or yes, by relocating for eight years in an urban poor community. He has degrees in continuing adult education and community development. So we welcome Peter as well. And today uh, we'll have the opportunity, I wanna go over quickly the agenda for uh, the conversation today. Um, and. and for those of you uh, joining us now, we, we welcome you as well. Um, today, we'll have the opportunity to cover the following topics. What are the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and their significance for our lives and the lives of people around the world? What are the social teachings of the church and how did they develop and what's their importance to this conversation? Then we'll tackle the major challenges of our society today how can we better advance the SDGs and the social teachings? And um, you know, we are living in a time of great uncertainty and some might say crisis 
but there are also important opportunities in moments like that. So we'll discuss how do we take advantage of this moment to create a better world. We'll end by looking at some practical examples of how to implement what was discussed in theory and lay out some ways that they can be applied in everyday life. So for those of you that have um, not used GoToMeeting before, just wanna point out a couple of practical things. Uh, on the right-hand side, you should be able to see a menu in which you can um, put your comments and questions, and <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be monitoring those throughout the webinar and when appropriate, interjecting with those questions. So we encourage your active participation in that. So without further ado, um, Peter, maybe you can share with us what the SDGs are and what is their significance. Uh, thank you so much. Um... Ryan for this uh, kind introduction and uh, the SDGs or this sustainable development goals are actually part of the 2030 agenda that uh, was uh, ratified by 193 nations in 2015 and they, they have come a long way, actually, as the United Nations were talking to multiple stakeholders and those 17 goals are basically part of what is called the, the 2030 agenda, where actually you have a framework, what you call the framework of the five Ps, which would be people, planet, prosperity. So those three, which you could call actually social, environmental and economical uh, growth or development and those are surrounded by the layer of of peace and partnerships so basically creating advancing economic social and environmental uh, development through a framework of partnership and peace which makes actually a lot of sense to to do it this way and what they hope to achieve is to have a kind of a universality not saying okay we are just focusing on on the developing countries but also seeing that the developed countries are also uh, part of this and have to do something uh, and especially if we look at for example carbon emissions if you would or climate change you would see that the developed countries are actually the main emitters of, of greenhouse gases and while the developing countries are mostly bearing the consequences of of this uh, situation so it's uh, universal all nations have to do something have to change have to work for transformation and the goal is to leave no one behind and to seeing there are people who are just left behind by development. If you would look into the last 50 years, um, humanity since World War II has developed incredibly. The number of, of poor ha people has decreased, the illiteracy has decreased, child mortality has decreased, but still there are people who have been left behind, who have no access to clean water, who have no access to basic necessities and and the goal is just to really to work together to to get these people also into the development and the basic idea behind is that everything is connected and cannot be divided so the goals if you look at the 17 goals they are all connected and you cannot say okay we just take a no hunger but then um we do uh, intensive agriculture, which destroys the soil, you know, it's, so we have to see how we can balance that to make sure we can feed everybody, but at the same time, uh, do it in a way that uh, protects the soil and, and have a, a sustainable system of agriculture. And it should be also inclusive. The idea is having an inclusiveness that all people and even uh, other um, our co-creatures are somehow being considered 
and, and the whole society is working together. And I think if you look at our divided world right now, that's really a major challenge where we say, how can we overcome all those barriers in society? And the idea is to do that through multi-stakeholder partnerships. So not saying, okay, that's the job of the government, the governments have to do it. No, it needs everybody, it needs um, the government, it needs the private sector, it needs the civil society, it needs religions, it uh, needs everybody to be involved and, and to do something um, to change. So that is basically uh, the heart of it, of the whole 2030 agenda. And the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, those are basically the the pressure points of where you want to, to move it forward. What are the issues at hand that has to be solved that have to, that you are struggling with. Uh, and so those are like, if you talk about no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being. So uh, there are a lot of people who, who have too much of it and some people who have not enough. And so then you have quality education, gender equality, clean water, clean energy, decent work, uh, innovation, reduced inequality, sustainable communities. So uh, really uh, uh, looking at the wider aspects of society like urbanization, then responsible consumption and production. So to see going away from the whole uh, G GDP uh, growth um, discussion as the only parameter of growth, but we should not just consume, 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 but look into a circular economy that everything that we consume is going going back into the um, economy, like just as nature is working, you know, taking nature as an example, and then going into the aspects of our planet that are in peril, like climate action, life below the water where plastic bank comes in, stop ocean plastic, uh, life on, on land, biodiversity loss, and then uh, the framework of peace and, and justice in our institution and partnerships to, to achieve the goal. So it's a holistic, it's a holistic framework and probably no society has achieved it. And unfortunately, I have to say that that COVID has been um, basically a, a big stumbling block in reversing a lot of the progress that has been done over the last five years. If you think this agenda has been put into, have been ratified 2015, which is now five years ago. And now if you look at COVID and, and the latest report that was published by the United Nations in almost all aspects, this last year has been brought reversal to gender equality, uh, has brought reversal to poverty, has brought reversal to access to, to education. Maybe there was a, a dive in greenhouse gases because of the lockdowns, but then uh, plastic pollution has skyrocketed and made up for it. So, so um, we have this wonderful framework, and uh, but we haven't really um, progressed much on it since we have ratified it. And so that is one of the major challenges we have to, to look into also how we as faith communities can, um, can help to, to make it uh, moving forward. So there's a lot of information in the internet about it. If you want to really get into it, there is heaps, tons of stuff that you can can research and it's actually inspiring that humanity has come together to to ratify such a framework and saying hey we all want to make something for the better because we have to change we can't continue like this and i think that's that's really uh, powerful now we really have to do it <laughs> that's that's about it actually <laughs> Wonderful, Peter. Well, a, a lot to um, a lot of, of challenges there, um, a lot of opportunities for the world. So many 
so many important um, categories identified of of of, um, of areas in which people are are suffering, and those of us living in in uh, developed nations are are called to really respond. So thank you for giving us that uh, that overview. Now I'd like to give uh, Siona the the opportunity to speak a little bit about the social teachings of the church and their own importance. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you to Peter and to Plastic Bank for organizing this webinar and this important discussion that's taking place at the, the close of the year, the five-year anniversary of the, the SDGs and indeed the Paris Agreement. Um, I might just say a word about um, GCCM in case any of the, um, the participants uh, aren't familiar with us. So, um, the Global Catholic Climate Movement, GCCM, was uh, founded in, in 2015, this same pivotal year in which the, the SDGs were agreed, um, when the, the international community and uh, the world was waking up and the international community was struggling to come to agreement on these this agenda for the next decade and on, um, uh, on, on how to, to tackle climate change. Um, GCCM is a, a movement, so we're made up of more than 700 member organizations of very diverse types from, um, from NGOs to religious orders, uh, educational institutions um, and individual members. So we have um, more than 15,000 people have come through our um, grassroots Laudato Si animator training program. So a really diverse group of, uh, of Catholic and faith communities coming to, together. And the, the role of GCCM is really to, to support the church worldwide to bring Laudato Si to life. So lots of um, complementarity and collaboration with, um, with the wonderful work of, of Plastic Bank. Um, and just to, um, to go back into to, um, to Peter's lovely overview of the, the SDGs and how this comes into Catholic social teaching um, with the relationship between them. I'm not going to consider myself the expert and I'm sure there will be participants here who would be much more um, expert than myself um, uh, in this, but I'm uh, very happy to share some reflections from GCCM's perspective on this, particularly in relation to Laudato C, which, is, uh, which was launched in 2015 um, and really brought that Kairos uh, moment that was happening globally to a new level um, and is really the, um, the Catholic social teaching that is so um, profoundly pertinent in terms of content and timing to, to this whole um, uh, agenda. Um, so the way I think a bit about um, the, the SDGs is about, you know, the SDGs are the, the the goals that the international community um, has set itself, what we want to achieve um, uh, globally. And the, it's very significant that La Data Sea emerged um, at the same time that Pope Francis launched this, um, this encyclical while these goals were being negotiated. The, the messages of La Data Sea resonated very strongly with this idea that Peter mentioned about bringing uh, environmental care, care and human development uh, together. But Laudato Si, the, the Catholic social teaching contribution um, of Pope Francis at that time was really to bring this debate to a whole other level, um, really reaching out to the whole of humanity. So to the Catholic community, the faith community, but to the whole humanity for a dialogue on the state of our common home. Um, really centering in on not only the ecological crisis, but the spiritual crisis that underpins it and the social crisis that results from it. So if the SDGs give us um, uh, the goals or where we want, what we want to achieve, what Catholic social teaching gives us is that integrated vision and the ways to get there. And not in terms of technology solutions or policy solutions or ideologies, but how we are in our hearts and minds, how we think of and interact with others how we understand our position and creation and how we engage with creation through our beliefs, words and actions. And this is really the contribution of, uh, of Laudato Si in 2015. And Pope Francis has continued um, that dialogue and that teaching um, also this year with Fratelli Tutti. And just to, to, to go to that idea um, of how, how we are in our hearts and minds and how this is linked to, to these global level goals and policies. Just to quote from Pope Francis in Laudato Si, he said, if we feel intimately united with all that exists, 
then sob sobriety and care will well up spontaneously. So we know from we know from um, we know from political science, um, we know from physics, and we know from our faith that creation is holistic. It is an integral ecology. We are creation and not separate to it. Uh, and this was one of the, the key messages from that atrocity. Our fellow human beings um, are our brothers and sisters, the rain, the sun, animals, um, all of these um, entities uh, are, are alive, all creation um, and all connected and indeed interdependent with one another in a kind of integral tapestry woven by the creator. So Pope Francis is really inviting us to to, 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 to stop, to pause and to reflect on our position um, in creation. Um, and going back to what Peter was saying about this, you know, bringing together again of the of environmental care um, and uh, human development. And this was such a valuable contribution um, of Pope Francis um, and Catholic social teaching. And it's an old teaching. It's an old, it's a, it's, uh, uh, in Catholic social teaching, the preferential option for the poor has always been there, has always been very strong. And that out see brought that up front and center when these um, goals and these were being negotiated and these de debates were being had um, and brought them together beautifully in this concept of hearing both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Um, and just to quote Pope Francis uh, again in that RTC, he said, the human environment and the natural environment deteriorate together. We cannot adequately combat environmental degradation unless we attend to causes related to human and social degradation. We have to realize that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. So maybe pause there before I go on too long, Ryan. That's that's wonderful. I think this is a, an excellent uh, introduction. And um, now what I'd like to do is is to um, invite the two of you to share how you see the SDGs and Catholic social teaching being related to one another. Well, if, if I may uh, start, um, I thought one thing, what is actually one issue why, the, why we have such a problem uh, with the SDGs is that also you need the value system, the inner compass, so to speak, <laughs> to drive them forward, that you're motivated, that you're passionate about that and i think that uh, the social catholic teachings are bringing that kind of inner spiritual values with them and and, and i think though so it, it needs such a kind of an internal value system or driver for people to be passionate to say i want this to happen and i will invest my life, I invest my time, I will maybe uh, even sacrifice something to, to make this uh, happen. Of course, there's also quite some overlap, like with the issue of solidarity and leaving no one behind, you know, it, those are, are also very much uh, related. So I would think that um, the SDG is, is the framework, but I would say the social teachings are more the underlying foundation to it, <laughs> to, to motivate people to make it happen, because in the end, it will be people who will make it happen, people who have that agenda as a priority for them, and it is part of, of the meaning or of their lives, you know? I, th I think it's an interesting connection that you make, Peter, and it, it goes back to this idea of our interconnectedness. Um, and we've spoken about this uh, in, in previous webinars, this idea that um, from a, a spiritual perspective, a theological perspective, when sin enters the world, there's a rupture, there are several ruptures that occur. And one of those ruptures is um, between um, the human person and God, 
within the human person between human people so the, be, between um, brothers and sisters if you will and then also uh, between the human person and creation and so i think it's uh, just to double down on on your explanation here peter i think it's so crucial when we look at um uh, these these goals that we understand that <clears throat> any system that is created is a projection of the interior of the human person and so when we understand better when we have a, a system of, of values as you say a, a a spiritual basis it helps us to create systems that are, are are more just that include also elements of mercy that include um values for um priorities so you know and 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 Pope Francis has spoken very frequently about um, this special option for the the most vulnerable and for the poor. And so I think that's that's really important when we when we think about um, applying these these goals going forward. So I want to keep the the webinar moving and us on time here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of the challenges. So. Um, here we are in, in, in 2020, we've lived uh, through an almost unprecedented time in, in modern history um, in which this pandemic has created greater in inequality across the world. Uh, those that have access to um, technology and higher levels of education are doing well and in some cases are doing better than they were a year ago while others that don't have those resources um, have potentially fallen into poverty or even extreme poverty. So in, in the context of this, how do the two of you see, um, what do you see as the major obstacles in our society today in the context of what, uh, what we're living uh, for the social teachings and the SDGs to gain momentum? I can start if that's helpful. Um, so that's a, a really good question, Ryan. Um, and I think, um, again, I'm going to go back to Pope Francis. He played such a leadership role in um, since the COVID pandemic really took hold. Um, I think the it was a time when the world needs moral and spiritual leadership um, uh, as well as they need uh, we need the health response and we need the financial support but just having that uh, in a uh, in, in this the whirlwind that was around us um, having someone who was able to um, to provide to provide leadership to provide cohesion to provide a vision um, and some answers some analysis of what of what was happening um, I think was so important and one of the things he has said continually since that time is that we come out of a crisis either better or worse. And how we come out is up to us. Um, and I would say that um, that is not yet decided. So whether we will come out of this global crisis better or worse uh, in, uh, in how we face the other crises that we're facing, the socio-ecological ecological crises, is still up to us. Um, and I think the thinking about you know the difficulty there has been in getting traction for the SDGs uh, in recent years um, since they were adopted, there are a variety of uh, reasons for that, and it depends what angle you're coming from. But I think some of the reasons I think we're finding it difficult to see the kind of transformative change that we need um, are because uh, on the one hand um, we have very powerful existing. Uh, structures and um, uh, stakeholders in society with vested interests to keep things the way they are um, and we're used to things the way they are so it can be very hard to to shift things and that's again why the pandemic is potentially created that upheaval that chaos in which we can actually change direction but that all that means also tackling and challenging some of those power structures those interests that would like to keep things as they are um, so that's one thing I would say. And another thing perhaps is that um, like we've had that the spiritual dimension has been 
has always been there, but we need to, to, to strengthen it in that we've always had the, the, the technology has been around for a while that can provide solutions. The, the policy ideas are there, um, industrial strategies and things are there, but what has been missing is you know how do we get there how do we how do we realize the the transformation in hearts and minds um about that internal transformation in order to be able to um to to realize the the external changes um and one final thing i would say is just um i think we have yet to realize our own power um as individuals as communities um, that we do hold a huge amount of power and by working together, we can create huge change. Um, we're just raising our voices, working together and raising our voices and we're, we're more connected than we ever have been. Um, and so that potential to, to work together, to raise our voices, to call for that transformational change and to challenge um, uh, some of those um, pre-existing um, policies and um, uh, vested interests that would like to keep things the way they are. Or maybe let Peter come in. <laughs> I think that's a very beautiful set, Kleina, and I think that that could happen and it doesn't need really too many people. Actually, the social science has shown if you have a, a decisive minority of 3.5% who wants change, the change will happen and we see already like uh, groups like Fridays for Future, they're already putting up the pressures and big companies are already um, responding to them. Like even um, companies like Shell are now investing into, into hydrogen plants, you know, <laughs> things. So of course they still have a long way to go, but you can see already some things are, are happening because people are raising their voice. And I just read a study that about the church and the SDGs and that in England, and it is uh, to, so to say that only a very little portion of religious messaging is related to the SDGs. And that means quite a lot of believers they don't know that the SDGs exist, you know, even in here in Germany, a lot of churches don't even know what Laudato Si is saying. <laughs> so, so probably what, what is an obstacle is that we haven't yet, yet get the message into out, you know, to say, hey, uh, it's not some, um, some environmental groups only you have this message which often by conservative christians are seen as leftist it's actually the mainstream teaching of the church our whole faith is all about it you know and and if you are serious about your faith uh get up and do something raise your voice it's important you know and i think that is where we really need to um where we have an obstacle that that we haven't done really the, the groundwork in organizing our communities around the goals and to, to inspire them about the power of, of these goals and how beautiful it is to get involved in, in, push, in moving those goals um, uh, forward. Because, uh, and I think that is what also Kina said, because the people actually, they have the power. You know they have the power to change it and and maybe we haven't actually we maybe need to tell them more about it we need to encourage them more to to find that power and to use it you know yeah i think if i can just jump in here um in this time of uncertainty um uh, in which i think in, in in certain parts of of the world and in certain countries we've seen a lack of real leadership on um, the issues we're, we're talking about right now uh, in, in response to the pandemic as well. And so I think that there's there's a tremendous opportunity for um, communities of faith to step up and to embrace <clears throat> the, the integral approach of Laudato Si. And I think so often, um, folks either misunderstand it or or reduce it. It's it's really about how we ought to live in our common home, 
everything from <clears throat> how do we build our cities to how do we um, understand our bodies within this world. And so I think there's a lot of richness there. And of course, in, in, in moments of uncertainty, uh, there's a time for, uh, and especially when there's a bit of a vacuum of leadership, there's an opportunity for us to really rise up and and provide that leadership. So I think I think we've got a lot of uh, reasons to hope right now as well. Any concluding thoughts from either of you on how do we overcome these challenges? <clears throat> All right. Well, um, what I'd like to talk about now is is transition a little bit from what we were talking about on the challenge side to this idea of the opportunities. I mentioned a little bit of um, an opportunity here in a time of crisis where leadership can step up. But what do the two of you see as opportunities for the faithful to create um, a lasting impact uh, using the social teachings to advance the SDGs? I'm going to let you start this time, Peter. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, there are two, two, two levels, you know, there is, um, and I think what we talked about is that it needs a partnership approach. It needs all um, uh, stakeholders to get involved. And, and just yesterday, the Vatican launched the Council for uh, Inclusive Capitalism, where big companies came together under the, under the Vatican uh, uh, to promote a transformation of the economical system that includes uh, everybody to do business in a different way, to do business for the common good. And I think that is actually the, the real meaning of economy, of taking care of the house, providing services for people who, who need it. And I think there are, like here in Germany, we have the Catholic Catholic business associations. There are a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, you know, who have a religious um, conviction. And I think the, the opportunity is that to pe for people to see that what you do on Sunday in the church and what you do on Monday in your business, it's just a continuation, you know, the, 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 the service of God is 24 seven. And to see, okay, maybe, do your business in a way that is congruent with the social teaching of the church and and what the Vatican has already provided this leadership I think then for other businesses is uh, to come along you know and, and look how can we do business the same way and there are a lot of studies that show that moving into a more inclusive economy will not crash the economy, but actually will advance it, will create more new jobs, new opportunities, uh, new innovations. And then I think another thing is that the parishes, uh, the, the church communities can work at the grassroots to, to build core groups and look what are the needs that we can address. How can we mobilize the resources in our community to provide a, a, change that is needed for the people that are around us like that goal of leaving nobody behind you know in every community there are some people who are are left behind and because of our global connections although the people who are left behind uh, far away they're also part of, of that and so how can we as as core groups in parishes and networks of parishes or dioceses, how can we make an impact? I think that would be some, these are tremendous opportunities, which now even with, with COVID through internet connections, you can still be connected, you know? Just to, to follow on that, I think I'll just share GCCM's um, uh, approach talks about yeah the, the opportunities and ways to 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 get involved um, in a transformation, um, and we come at it from three approaches and again very much based in the the approach of Laudato C um, around um, uh, eco conversion, internal conversion, um, eco spirituality. Um, 
sustainable lifestyles, so uh, changing things in our own lives, in our own homes and parishes, and then raising our voices. So um, approaching the, the challenge from, from these angles, from these three angles in a holistic way. Um, and on the, the eco-conversion side, that eco-spirituality is the, the idea that you know, this this whole, as we talked about earlier, like at the roots of this crisis is also a spiritual crisis. It's a disconnect. We have become disconnected from creation and from the creator. Um, and so there is um, there's a really important but also beautiful journey um, for uh, in, in reconnecting um, with, the, with the creator in that way. Um, and um, so we encourage people to... Um, uh, through our our, our uh, eco spirituality programs uh, and in our um, grassroots training, to be able to um, to connect with eco spirituality, so uh, it coming together in that out of sea circles and their in their parishes to come and, and pray together, um, to pray outside, so to to hold whole mass outside and things like that to connect um, in that way um, uh, in connection with the world around them, um, and then when it comes to um, uh, then uh, lifestyle. So looking at looking at our at our own our own lives, our own practices, um, and uh, then in, in our homes, in our parishes. There's a lot of work going on in the parishes um, uh, all over the world. Um, some great examples, and that's only going to get stronger and stronger um, uh, as a as a very practical thing that um, that the that people of faith can can do. Um, whether it's in our in your own home, we're bringing it to your parish, we're setting up um, green teams, uh, ecological uh, or creation care teams in in the parishes and things like that, or, or in the in the order and the institution. Um, and then on the 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 third angle, then the the raising our voices, so coming together to to raise our voice. Um, on whether it's local issues, whether it's national issues, um, regional or global issues, but making our voice heard. And the the first angle, the the eco spirituality, is really the linchpin. It's the the core for all of the rest. Because if we have that, if we're coming from that very authentic place in our hearts and minds, then all the rest comes very authentically. It comes very naturally, um, and it's all part of the continuation of that um, of that journey. Um, so there's uh, there's a lot of opportunity. There's there's so much that can be done, and and Catholic social teaching, La Rato C, provides uh, all that basis, that 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 guidance, and um, and there's it's great to see the churches all over the world and uh, church organizations all over the world responding to that, and picking it up and running with it, and coming up with their own ideas uh, and ways of implementing it. Wonderful. Well. Um, what I'd like to do now is is to take the opportunity for the two of you to maybe share a little bit of some of the practical ways in which your organizations are um, are implementing some of the things that we we spoke about. And for those folks that have joined us, in what ways um, might you inspire them to get involved to um, to really um, apply their faith and, and help transform uh, the communities in which they live. What are we okay, um, Peter, would you like to start? Yeah. Actually, I made Kleena the moderator. If Kleena, you want to show your, you want to oh, share your sure. slides? Okay, great. Yeah, give me one second here. Okay. So these I, I um I mentioned already some of the um some of the things that we um encourage and support people to do is this um coming to coming to together um to 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 um to further their ego spirituality. Sorry, I'm showing you now, Peter. I'm not sure how that happened. <laughs> um uh, to further their, their ego spirituality, whether that's in monthly um, Ladato Sea circles coming together once a month to, to pray. And many of the circles have continued to do that online during lockdown. This is a picture here um, of um, uh, in Italy where uh, Ladato Sea animators um, came together um, and were going on uh, creation walks. So walks in, in creation to, um, to be with the creator, to be with creation, to to pray um, together and to be in community. Um, hopefully, my slides are not cooperating. Oh, there. 
Um, another, uh, this is a, a picture then of uh, in uh, in Pakistan. Uh, in terms of action, then um, the. Uh, uh, we see a lot of um, uh, communities coming out and doing things in their in their parishes and their communities, whether that's seed planting in Pakistan, and we've seen that in in countries all over the all over the world, led by faith communities, um, or uh, in uh, creating gardens in their parish, uh, installing in uh, in season of creation this year in Poland, there was a big drive to install air quality um, uh, uh, testers and. Um, uh, Water, um, water harvesting um, uh, technology, as well. So really practical things that um, that uh, people are doing in their um, uh, in their parishes and their communities. So just share this um, this one slide, and it's just to give a sense of the the variety of um, of things that are the opportunities that are out there for people to get engaged in. Um, uh, in uh, in greening their whether it's their home, their parish, their their institution, um, and I would invite you to, to to have a look for the resources online because there's a huge amount out, out, out there. Whether it's on the GCCM website through Plastic Bank um, to work on plastic, there are, there's a huge amount out there. Um, so whether you want to start small, um, or whether you want to start with the big uh, pieces like um, your energy use um, and energy suppliers and things like that, there's a huge you might out there that can be done. Um, and then one thing um, that we, uh, that GCCM has been um, uh, promoting since um, 2016 is fossil fuel divestment. So this is moving on to the, the third pillar. So we have the eco spirituality, the um, eco action, and then the uh, eco justice advocacy. Um, a core component of that for GCCM has been the Catholic fossil fuel divestment movement. So since beginning in 2016, um, the, the faith community in general has been really leading um, the, the global fossil fuel divestment movement. And since 2016, the Catholic community has really um, have really become leaders um, in that movement. We've had more than 230 Catholic institutions around the world um, join the divestment movement. Um, it is a really profound and powerful way for um, Catholic institutions um, from bishops conferences and dioceses um, to educational institutions, religious orders, to really make a very powerful statement um, about um, the, um, the, what is in line with uh, the common good and what is not. So by saying we choose to not uh, invest in fossil fuels, um, this sends a huge uh, message both within their own community, but also within their um, the context in which they live to their uh, to the people that uh, that follow them, that um, are familiar with them, um, to the, even to their governments and to these companies. Um, that uh, that um, the, the the common good means we cannot uh, continue to invest in fossil fuels because we know that. Um, uh, if we if we do not uh, transition out of fossil fuels very quickly, there is no way we will remain within the the global goals set out in the Paris Agreement. Um, and in a huge moment um, er, earlier this year, um, the the Vatican published um, a wonderful document. You can see it here, journeying towards care for our common home. So it's a kind of a compilation of good practices um, and guidelines developed, um, garnered from good practice uh, uh, across the, the world of how different Catholic actors and institutions are implementing La Dato Si and bringing that together to, to, just to show what the church is doing globally. And within that, um, these guidelines um, issued by the Vatican actually recognized the, the leadership of the Catholic community on the issue of fossil fuel divestment and included as one of the good practices in endorsing Catholic institutions avoiding supporting companies that harm human uh, or social uh, ecology, um, including the example of fossil fuels. So this was a this is a huge endorsement. So we ex we would imagine that the Catholic leadership within this um, important movement will continue to grow. And the next uh, announcement will be. Um, uh, probably April next year. So um, we'd invite anyone who's interested to, to become involved in that to, to get in touch with us. And what the final thing I would say, and again, this is um, on still on um, the, the ego justice, the ego advocacy justice component, uh, is, is that idea of, of raising our voices. So divestment is a very 
a very concrete and powerful way to raise our voice, but there are so many other ways. Um, the photo here is actually a photo from a campaign we ran in Ireland. Um, the Bishops' Conference in Ireland committed to divestment in um, 2018. Um, and in the same year, um, we campaigned for the Irish government to divest a national fund from fossil fuels. So there was a huge divestment movement, which really brought faith um, and secular um, communities to, together, calling for this goal for our common good. Um, and another example here, I think if you can see, um, uh, we have the Pope meeting the infamous Greta Thunberg. So the Pope um, has, you know, has spoken out so many times about intergenerational justice um, and has really um, supported the young people in getting out to the streets and calling um, for action to protect their future. Um, and we've seen Catholics um, across the world coming out in support of those climate strikes um, and climate days of action in their local communities or in their state capitals or um, at the national level anything like that. So those are just some examples um, in the, the area of the, those three angles, the eco-spirituality, the eco-action and the eco-justice um, and advocacy. Um, and there's there's so much that can be done. It's really just a question of finding what works for you, it, what's, what's relevant um, uh, in, in your context and how can you get involved. Excellent, excellent. So many important initiatives, and um, the timing couldn't be better for us to get involved in these types of things. Now, Peter, you you also have a number of uh, very practical uh, examples that you can share um, from the perspective of Plastic Bank. Yes. Uh, take over the screen for me, Peter. I'm not sure if everyone yeah, can still see yeah. the screen. Well, I put myself okay. as a moderator. Okay. Now uh, you should see my screen. So for Plastic Bank, Plastic Bank is a social business. And uh, the issue we are addressing is ocean plastic. And the plastic crisis is the, the I think I, I call plastic crisis and uh, and the climate change. They are ugly siblings, actually. They belong. They are part of the same family because also plastic is made out of fossil fuel as well. And in the in the moment, we have about eight to ten million tons of plastic who go into the oceans every year. And uh, in the next twenty years, that will triple. Actually, um, and so we are really. Um, here in for uh, another disaster though that is about uh, one dump truck per, per minute and then it will be two three dump trucks per minute and once the plastic is in the ocean you can't really get it out anymore it's it, it's stuck there and if you continue like that by 2050 we have as much uh, plastic in the volume or the weight of the plastic in the ocean will be the same as the weight of fish and so so plastic banks advocacy uh, is to really to to change that and so so what we have done we have set up collection points in places that are close to the coast in countries where most plastic is leaking into the ocean and so those are like the number one is china number two is uh, indonesia number three philippines number four vietnam in south america brazil is the number one is number is 12 globally and then also we are in egypt then haiti one is the poorest country in the northern hemisphere which has a very little waste management systems also uh, leaking lots of plastic so plastic from haiti is washed up in the beaches in florida for example so over the last uh, four years, Plastic has set up 350 collection points, has collected 50 million kilogram of plastic, which will about 850 million bottles. We are working mostly with informal collectors. And so this is where we come in as an um, organization that's very strong as the SDGs, because we see those informal waste collectors are the most vulnerable in the whole um, waste recycling, um, supply chain and so the plastic that we recycle we sell it to companies uh, who 
bring services to these people. And so we work with 6,000 informal collectors and we have about prevented through that about 23,000 tons of, of CO2 emission. So the collectors who work with us, they can, imp they can improve their lives by partnering with us and the services that we provide is not only a higher cash uh, income, because we are selling the plastic as a premium price, so it's a fair trade plastic raw material that we are selling, but we also work with other actors, other stakeholders for development together. So also we help to provide access to clean water, fresh food, cube, cooking fuel, power, cell phone service, school tuition, like in Haiti, we work with the schools where not now because of COVID they're closed, but the, the families can pay the school tuition in the schools with plastic bottles. And also we are working with micro insurances. So our uh, waste collectors also have access to micro insurance for, for health insurance. And because of the blockchain app that or the blockchain platform, we can also provide digital say, uh, services. So uh, uh, last my solution to make the unbankable bankable so people have savings account who who never had some before and so this is a kind of a very holistic approach to to recycling and um so we're working with companies like henkel in germany who who uses this plastic in in their packaging material and so people who buy those goods make an impact because the, the the packaging is is coming from is social plastic that is helping the poor and so the circular economy that we are creating is also is very in is very inclusive and so I think uh, plastic bank is an example on how inclusive capitalism uh, can work in, in in a powerful way and we also have worked reach out to to the church and, and the Catholic Church has been very welcoming uh, to Plastic Bank. Uh, our pilot project is in Brazil. We are working with Archdiocese in Rio de Janeiro, also north of Brazil, the Archdiocese of Vitoria, and we are setting up 55 plastic collection points in 55 different parishes there. So far, nine have been involved. We, have, we started plastic collection two months ago because uh, COVID has delayed us, and so far we have collected three three tons of plastic so the people in the parish they bring their plastic as a donation to the church just like the, the, the offering on sunday and the uh, the church sells it to us and and through the income that the church generates the church uses that for social services in in their community and especially now in covid where also the churches have hard time to continue the social services. This extra income has been um, very welcome. And so I think in, in that way, the, the church and Plastic Bank and other faith communities uh, are also working together. We have a partnership with the World Evangelical Alliance uh, as well. I think we are welcoming every religious community that is uh, committed to peace and partnership to to work with us to stop ocean plastic wonderful thank you both i think uh, two very um important approaches to putting our faith into action i think that every one of us uh, can get involved with uh, being activists by getting involved in our local communities by encouraging certain changes and and policies to be more um uh, more um i don't i don't want to reduce it to say environmentally friendly because we need to be so much more than that we need to really um embrace our call to the stewardship of of creation and so creating policies around that and um and then from the perspective of of plastic bank you know something very very practical very something that every faith community can can get involved in everything from collecting the plastic to 
Um, and Peter, uh, maybe you can share the, the resources that are on the Plastic Bank website for those that, uh, that are connected here. Yes, we have an online learning platform on our website and we have developed uh, religious material for uh, creation care where we use the teachings of the church, the Bible, to have homilies, Bible studies. We have youth uh, lessons there. We also have practical uh, steps, how to, like how to do a waste audit in your church or in your school, uh, how to reduce your plastic footprint, how to set up a, a collection point in your church, how to organize your, your communities. All those lessons are, are online. They are uh, also translated in several languages. We have them there in Spanish, in, in Portuguese, and in Bahasa, uh, Indonesia. And we are developing uh, more as, as we go. <laughs> And Cleona, uh, what about um, from from your end? What um, what resources might our, uh, our our attendees be able to find online? Thanks, Ryan. Um, there's lots there. Uh, there's uh, an eco parish guide. Um, there's the Catholic divestment toolkit. Um, uh, there, if the divestment is what you'd like to get involved in. Um, and yeah, loads of eco-spirituality uh, materials as well. Um, we have a monthly online prayer service um, that uh, there are uh, monthly uh, resources for that, where we connect as a global community and come together and pray. Um, and uh, yeah, hu huge amount of resources. So I would yeah encourage people to to sign up and um, receive the um, notifications about these gatherings and other moments where you can uh, come together and raise your voice. Um, also at the, the global level, um, one of our big campaigns is also Season of Creation, which is an ecumenical celebration um, every September through to the beginning of October, which is a wonderful um, period of four weeks uh, where the, the Christian communities across all the world um, celebrate creation. So they pray, reflect and act together um, uh, in, in their own communities and connecting together at the global level. And it's a wonderful celebration um, and a, a great opportunity to for the, for the faith communities to, to show um, their, um, their commitment, uh, their united um, front on these issues and also to deepen their own journey. Excellent. Well, we've come up to the top of the hour here. So I want to thank all of the attendees for their participation, for following. Um, could, uh, could the two of you, you've provided online resources. If, if folks want to follow up with, with questions or engage with your organizations, can you share maybe the best way to do that? I think um, it's probably sending a, a message on uh, on social media, uh, on the Facebook page, uh, or um, or even sending a, a, an email to the um, on the the website, and we'll we'll get you to the right person. <laughs> Perfect. And Peter? Yes, we will be sending an email to all of you in two days, and maybe uh, if you can send me a, a link to your website, then we can Great. do that, yeah. so people can get access. Uh, to, to all resources, and I think we had, uh, I have answered most of the questions online. There was just one a question I would maybe would like to bring up where, where Yvonne is asking, um, she has the experience when you come up with environmental messages that you're being called leftist in the church, and she was wondering, is there a way to, to help her? And I said, uh, it seems that Laudato Si would be a good way to, to include, in, to introduce it to your church because I think um, the Pope himself is, is a promoter of it and I think that could be a, a good way um, to do it. Um, maybe if, if Klina or, or, um, or Ryan, if you just have a short message for, for Yvonne to, uh, to help her. <laughs> Great. Well, I think it. Cleona, um, <clears throat> did you did you want to respond to that or? Oh, sorry, I didn't realize it was directed at me. Is it on the the use of Laudato Si? 
Peter, could you yeah, repeat? Yeah, without being uh, labeled easily uh, that you're coming from a leftist leftist kind of background or agenda. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, very challenging in certain contexts where these issues, which are not political, but have been made political. Um, so these are issues for uh, all of us, regardless of our um, political orientations. Um, and I, that is the, we know that, and that is the, the truth we need to hold as we engage with um, with people um, and uh, the the message of Lad Out of Sea and like really grounding everything in um, the Catholic social teaching in the um, in the spirituality um, is is a great way to bring down walls and to create new dialogue. Um, some people don't want to listen, but um, but it is a wonderful way to to reach new people and to to create new new ways of um, of dialoguing um, and building bridges. And and I would add um, to follow up on that that. You know, it's 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 very much very clear in Scripture, our call from Genesis um, to be stewards of creation, and so it it transcends um, politics. Um, if 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 we reduce it just to politics, then we're missing the point of Laudato Si. Laudato Si is a call for us um, to convert to become uh, more faithful Christians, to integrate uh, the teachings of, of Christ and um, of the scriptures into all aspects of our life. And in the way that we, we live, um, we treat the environment and the environment, and this is why I think this document is so important in, in which it's called Our Common Home. It's it's really would you trash your own home? Is that leftist to have a trashed home? <laughs> of course it's not. It's it's, civilized. it's human to create uh, an environment of peace, of tranquility, of harmony. And so if we are tasked with creating a home like that, then why wouldn't we want to do the same? outside of our of the walls of our intimate home and 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 apply that to our shared common home so i think that it's it's a call to move from a savage um, um, reality to a more humane reality and and i would even go as far as saying to go from humane to divine it's a divine call to reconcile creation and to perfect creation. This is one of the tasks of the human person. So it's a deeply Christian uh, message that we need to recover and we need to strip away from, from the politics. So on that note, um, we're a little bit over time here. Again, I wanna thank all of the attendees. I wanna thank our, our wonderful panelists for their insight and their contributions. I wish both of you um, the best and, and many blessings on all of the work that you're doing and on all of your organizations. As Peter said, we will follow up with an email to the attendees um, in case you want to follow up with additional um, information or get involved in these specific organizations. So I thank you very much. I wish you well and God bless all of you. Yes, God bless you. Thank you, Ryan. You said that so beautifully, and thank you, thank you, Kleena, for thank you so much. Uh, joining us. Yes. Okay. Bye. <laughs>